In terms of trying to estimate job numbers, um, some of the package we're about to release involves direct government investment, and it's pretty easy to estimate the numbers around direct government investment. Um, but the bulk of the package is about private sector growth and private sector jobs, um, because that's where the bulk of the jobs need to come from. And uh, estimating the number of jobs uh, from the private sector is an inexact science. We know there's tremendous opportunity. Um, but so that we're using 100,000 green jobs as a kind of overriding figure, but it could be significantly larger than that, and in the long run it has to be. The background to all of this is the global picture. Um, so the United Nations has been pushing very hard on this, that not only do we need to make this transition, but there are lots of jobs to be gained in the process of making this transition. Um, there are endless books. There's like a forest of books now that have come out about the, the clean technology sector and taking advantages of the new green economy. I mean, there's heaps and heaps more than this. Um, some of them from surprising sources, like Thomas Friedman, who uh, tends to be a very conservative economist in many respects. Um, he's talking very, pushing very strongly about taking advantage of the new green economy and getting into it. In New Zealand, uh, we've had the Pure Advantage Group has been promoting these issues, um, which is a group of leading New Zealand business people. Uh, it includes people like Rob Fly from Air New Zealand and Rob Morrison's brother Lloyd from Infratil and numerous others um, engaged in that process, Philip Mills, um, who are all pushing to say New Zealand needs to make the most of these opportunities. <clears throat> and of course the government's own, the government has set up its own green advisory group. Um, now, you know, we would argue that the ambition of the government's green advisory group isn't good, and I saw um, Jan Wright has put a statement out today um, about the, the limits that were put on the terms of reference of that group. Um, but at least uh, it's starting, the government itself is um, being pushed slowly or <laughs> ever so slowly in this direction to engage with this space. <clears throat> so the, the ten areas I want to go through, the first is about direct government investment. What we know is that this is the, if you like, the, a very fast way to produce change, um, and it's necessary. So the United Nations say, look, markets are essential to it, but so is direct government investment. Um, and so the, the first part of it, I just want to talk about four areas. There's more detail in the booklets we've handed out. Um, but the first is about extending the, um, the home insulation scheme. Uh, we've done 100,000 households. We've got the budget for another 100,000. We're saying extend it to a further 200,000 households. Um, this has very significant paybacks in terms of the investment. It's a great scheme. Um, it's something we're very proud of, and we think it can be taken further. It has real jobs advantages as well. The second part of it is about um, filling some of the gaps that are currently in the shortages around housing. Um, before the Christchurch rebuild gets absolutely underway, which will produce significant capacity constraints in the building sector, um, we think that we need to use the time between now and then to actually fill some of the gaps that there are currently in state and um, other kinds of community sector housing. Um, so uh, an expanded build there. The third part of it is a series of investments to protect our natural environment. Um, this is, um, if you like, about brand protection, but it's not just about brand protection. Um, I've talked a bit about the riparian fencing and planting projects, but there's a number of projects, including pest control, uh, that are really quite essential if we are to protect the long-term viability of the New Zealand economy. And the fourth part of the direct government investment is a, is a very small investment, but it's quite significant. It's about providing some certainty in the forestry sector. Um, so we've seen some increase in, in forestry plantings, but um, by providing some certainty around price um, in the forestry sector, and there's more detail in the booklet, um, we can stimulate a lot of jobs in the sector and also um, sequester a lot of carbon um, for a relatively small investment. It's just about providing some certainty around price. This is very important for New Zealand because, um, as I'm sure people realise, that in 2020 we're going to run into real um, problems in terms of our Kyoto accounts. Um, as those forests start to be harvested. So the forestry we've planted will cover us through to 2012 in terms of sequestering emissions. Um, but once those forests start to be harvested, we're going to have a big spike in greenhouse emissions coming out of New Zealand. So providing some certainty to the forestry sector now will help us get through that period in the early 2020s when those forests are harvested. The second area is around um, infrastructure, but particularly I want to talk about the, the energy companies. Um, <clears throat> This is perhaps New Zealand's great um, opportunity globally, is the expansion in renewable energy um, globally. I mean, there's all sorts of numbers thrown around. This is, a, you know, this is currently a $400 billion a year industry. It could be an $800 billion a year industry by 2015. Um, this is a huge opportunity for us as a country um, because of the expertise we have in this area. Um, us and Iceland obviously lead the world in terms of renewable electricity generation. Obviously, it's not just about electricity, it's about um, other kinds of liquid fuels as well. 
um, but we do have a specific advantage here. <coughs> um, this is a this is a picture of a, a one of our you know where we have particular advantage is actually geothermal, and um, this is a picture of a micro geothermal plant. This is an American built plant um, in Utah, um, but um, these are the kinds of plants that we actually have um, great ability to produce in New Zealand. So the first thing is uh, we would argue that we need to keep the energy companies in um, in state ownership. Um, so that we retain the ability to use them to lead this kind of economic transformation. But what we want to do with them is focus them on the export potential. Uh, so currently these energy companies, they, they, some of them are a bit focused on export, but we want to really make them look at the export potential around renewables so that we can get a piece of the global action in terms of renewable energy. Um, and we want them to partner with private sector entrepreneurs. So we're saying keep them in public ownership, but encourage them into partnerships with the private sector. Um, so that way we keep the headquarters in New Zealand, we keep the R&D in New Zealand, but we get the benefits that come with partnering with the private sector. And we think that's quite an important part of it. Um, some of the energy companies have actually been doing this, um, but we would encourage them to do more of it. In terms of providing capital, uh, one of the government's arguments around privatisation of the energy companies is they needed access to capital. Actually, you don't have to privatise them to get access to capital. These companies can issue energy bonds, which would actually be very attractive to New Zealand investors um, who have been so burnt by the finance company disaster. I mean, it would be a chance for people to be part of the green economic and energy revolution. We're saying target 1% of the global market. Um, targeting 1% of the global market, uh, you know, this is something, if we were to get 1% of the global renewable energy market, we're talking 40,000 to 60,000 jobs in New Zealand. It is, a, it is such a large global market. If you think about dairy, um, we're 2% of global dairy production. We're about a third of the export market in dairying. Um, we can be ambitious about getting a chunk of the global renewable energy market. We're nicely positioned to do it. If you think about New Zealand's GDP, we're only 0.16 of global GDP, um, but we could easily be 1% of this global market. It is a tremendous opportunity for our country, but we need to orient ourselves to it and embrace it. <clears throat> the third area that I want to talk about is um, SMEs. So small to medium-sized enterprises are obviously a very important part of the New Zealand economy. Um, <clears throat> and one of the very critical ways that we can help those um, small to medium-sized enterprises is through government procurement. Um, so, you know, actually making sure that there is a, a market, a, re, a, a steady market for those small to medium-sized enterprises in New Zealand. Um, and so one of the first steps we do is actually green government procurement to give an opportunity for the small to medium-sized enterprises in New Zealand that want a ready market for their products. Um, government has this ability. Now, obviously, in the long run, those SMEs need to look at much more than the government sector. Um, but in the first instance, in terms of providing some kind of basic market opportunity, government can do that. We'd also offer a small startup fund, um, $100 million for clean technology SMEs. Uh, that's over three years. All the costings in here are over, are over three financial years. Um, <clears throat> this is a, one of the issues is that with, when you look at venture capital, um, uh, Nick might want to talk about more about this later, but there are gaps within the venture capital market in New Zealand. And so we need to have a little bit of government intervention to fill some of those venture capital uh, gaps that enable companies to scale up. Uh, and finally, w we think that we need to simplify the tax for micro and small business. Um, a lot of very small businesses spend a lot of their time um, dealing with the IRD. Um, the Institute of Chartered Accountants has got some really interesting and good proposals around simplifying the tax system for small business that would help them a lot. So they can spend more time um, turning great ideas into markets rather than filling out forms. <laughs> the next one is driving innovation. Um, if we're going to make this transition, then we need to drive green innovation. Um, and that has to be absolutely um, essential, that we, that we drive innovation right across the, the economy. So what, if you look at our spending on research and development, um, this is New Zealand over here. Um, so you can see within the OECD, we're, we're right down the bottom. 1.31% um, of GDP combined um, government and private sector R&D spending. And this is your um, OECD average up here. Um, over 2%. So we are way behind the eight ball in terms of R&D spending. And, and if we stay down here, um, we are not going to make the, the invest in the kind of innovation that we need. Um, so it's quite critical we improve that. So we're proposing a boost in government spending over three years of $1 billion um, in R&D. Now, that would be, wh whether that's delivered through tax credits or whether through grants, 
Um, we, we're kind of agnostic. Let's just be practical about the best way to deliver it because um, I know that Labor and National have got different views about how that should be delivered. But the key thing is to make sure that it is delivered and that it's matched to private sector investment as well. <clears throat> we also need to ramp up standards. Um, one of the ways that we've seen driving innovation across the world has been to improve standards. I mean, California has probably been the leader in this. By improving energy efficiency standards, they've been driving up innovation. Um, the OECD report uh, about innovation and green technology pointed particularly to the role of standards in terms of driving innovation. So the fifth area is regulation and making sure that we have smarter regulation and consistent regulation. And the PricewaterhouseCoopers um, survey of CEOs, what they found was that CEOs are looking for clear, consistent government policy. Um, so not the kind of delay and prevarication that we've seen in New Zealand uh, just recently around um, climate change. Um, we need consistent policy about it. Um, so whether that's very consistent policy around water um, or whether it's around minimum energy performance standards and associated with that, of course, is average fuel efficiency standards, we need smart regulation that sits behind all of this and provides a consistent driver to green innovation. The sixth thing is getting the price right. Um, <clears throat> It's hard to underestimate how important it is to get prices right. I mean, governments can do all sorts of things. Governments can have interventions here, there, and everywhere. Um, but actually, economies like ours, a market-based economy, there are a million decisions being made today across New Zealand, and are, most of them are being made on the basis of price. So we need to get prices right um, if we are to drive the innovation. Um, <clears throat> Uh, Treasury in Australia, uh, the federal government in Australia produced a report about getting prices right on carbon. And what they said is that economies that defer putting in a carbon price actually have a longer term cost. Um, because of course, uh, the longer you delay, the, the higher the cost of adjustment. Because it means that you have all these investments um, that are put in place when you expected the price of carbon to be low. And then of course they become outdated as the price of carbon rises. <coughs> Um, the OECD has said similar things about internalising the cost of externalities. Um, so externalities like climate change, externalities like water pollution, if we don't have prices that internalise those externalities, um, it, the, by internalising those externalities rather, we can actually drive innovation. Um, and that's one of the key points that's come out of all the studies in this area. So that's why we need a proper price on carbon uh, around the ETS. It's why we need a proper price on the commercial use of water. It's why a waste levy has been quite important already. Uh, we've been seeing some innovation being driven around uh, reducing waste to landfill. Um, I was in Rotorua just uh, yesterday um, where they're doing some very interesting work about reducing waste to landfill and, and creating innovation in products and services that will ultimately be commercialised. And we need to look at mining um, and the mining royalties. New Zealand has a very low, uh, internationally has a very low system of mining royalties um, right down at the bottom of the OECD. Um, and that means that we're not pricing our minerals properly. Um, and that means that uh, the future generations are essentially losing out because we're consuming the resource uh, and there's very little being saved for the future. And I'll talk about that more in a second. <clears throat> the seventh element is brand protection. Um, brand protection, we've talked to, everyone talks about that, you know, clean green New Zealand and how important it is. Um, Actually, it is really important. I know we talk about it a lot, but it, um, it's hard to underestimate how important it is. This is a, a quote from Tim Grosser. Um, where he's talking about the risk to New Zealand is that our customers will be, uh, if the brand is, de is de dented or, or damaged, that our customers will walk away from us, and particularly our retailers. Um, <clears throat> we've seen that, for example, with fish in, in, in the United Kingdom. Uh, fish, uh, now New Zealand fish have been banned from a number of supermarkets because of the environmentally destructive practices of the New Zealand fishing industry. Um, so that is a real warning shot for us that we could lose market access. <clears throat> Likewise, the OECD has said very similar things. Um, they've said that the, you shouldn't underestimate the value of our brand in a world that's becoming increasingly concerned about environmental issues. So we need to take some just basic action to protect the brand. That's about cleaning up fresh water. That's about action on greenhouse emissions because you know we do have one of the highest greenhouse emissions per capita around the world. Um, it's about dealing with animal practices, um, farming practices. It's actually a real sensitivity in our overseas markets, the way we treat animals on our farms. And it's about ending the destructive, destructive fishing practices. Um, that's all about protecting the clean, green and safe New Zealand brand. Um, and it's absolutely critical that we do protect that brand. The eighth area I wanted to touch on was capital market reform. Um, 
this is really important for the New Zealand economy in general, but it's also important specifically in terms of green, the green economy, um, is actually making sure that we have a competitive um, capital market. Um, as Alan Bollard says here, um, in his couched language, because of course as Governor of the Reserve Bank, um, he's pretty couched, he says a lack of competition in the banking sector may have pushed up the price of credit. Um, and of course, uh, I think there's a lot of evidence that it has pushed up the price of credit. So the first thing is we need to strengthen Kiwi Bank in the banking sector um, to get competition. So that means letting Kiwi Bank retain its um, earnings so that it can reinvest them and expand. It may mean a capital injection into Kiwi Bank, though that's probably not on the cards at the moment. <clears throat> it means capital gains tax, excluding the family home, to drive capital into the productive sector and out of the housing sector. It means giving the Reserve Bank more policy tools so that they don't always have to rely on interest rates when they're trying to drive, drive down inflation. Um, the, the Basel III has given the Reserve Bank a bunch of tools to deal with asset bubble inflation, um, which I'm happy to talk about later, but has been covered at, on Finance and Expenditure Committee at various times. The other one is um, exploring an option for KiwiSaver. Uh, we don't have a public option for KiwiSaver at the moment. Um, so. Uh, using the New Zealand Superannuation Fund as a low-cost provider of KiwiSaver. Now, the Super Fund wasn't set up for that purpose because when you think about it, it was to be sold down eventually. But the Super Fund does have certain benefits in terms of low-cost provision um, of investment services. Um, and so I think we need to look at whether that should be provided as a public option because there isn't a public option for KiwiSaver at the moment. And finally, in ter if we are uh, talking about increasing the royalties from um, mining, um, one of the things that I think we need to put a line or at least put a flag in the sand in at the moment is about what we do with those increased royalties. Currently we essentially consume them or spend them and they just go into the government bottom line. Um, overseas uh, a lot of governments have started to set up um, my reserve funds or sovereign wealth funds where a lot of the royalties from uh, these kind of mining activities have ended up. I mean, if it were to happen that there was a, a very large oil find in New Zealand or so, some such, it's important that we don't go down the kind of Nigerian path or the UK path and just spend all the money, um, but actually we do create a reserve fund for future generations um, rather than just simply blow it all. Uh, the ninth area is about making workplaces fairer. Um, in this transition, um, we need to make sure that in the transition to the green economy that we do it in a fair way, that we're a decent jobs, well paid. And that's something that's certainly been at the focus of the UN. <clears throat> so part of it is making sure that we have decent, well paid jobs, um, green jobs. Part of it is about making sure that we have a decent minimum wage, the, the $15 an hour minimum wage. Uh, and part of it is about strengthening collective bargaining rights. Um, the unionism in the private sector in New Zealand is relatively weak. Um, and we need to make sure that we strengthen collective bargaining rights to make sure that there are decent wages and conditions and also engaging workers um, actually in the productive process uh, because uh, the experience overseas is that, if you look at Germany for example, um, having worker participation in large corporations has been immensely useful for those corporations and Germany being one of the most successful economies on the planet. <coughs> and finally, it's about measuring. Um, <coughs> if you don't measure things, you're not going to take them into account. GDP is a pretty dumb measure. Um, it's one thing, we should keep it, but we need a bunch of other things as well. Uh, GDP by itself um, just doesn't tell us enough. Um, so the OECD General Secretary, as well as President Sarkozy from France, and um, a, a list of um, very important people, as long as my arm, have all been saying um, that we need uh, alternative measures, not just GDP. Uh, and so the Greens have been promoting those. Um, Kennedy Graham, I think he's here. Um, hi Ken. Ken's put up a bill about exactly this. The idea is, is that you need a dashboard of indicators. GDP is one indicator, but you need a dashboard of social and environmental indicators. Treasury's done some interesting work about the social indicators uh, quite recently. Um, and so we've made some progress towards getting alternative indicators, but we need a dashboard of them. Um, finally, there's the, um, the fiscal impacts. Um, of all of this. It's quite in, this is over, so this is looking over three financial years. Um, what, what I've, um, there's probably, there's more detail in your books rather than trying to get it off the PowerPoint, but what we've tried to do was um, look at our priorities. Um, so, you know, as a, as a, um, as a 10 to 15 percent party, um, going into negotiations after the next election, um, we need to prioritise about what things we're, we're pushing for, if you like. 
Um, so it's quite important for us that we are very clear when we go to the electorate what things we will be prioritised to put to advocate for, and then in terms of getting the costings together. So you'll see the costings there are pretty conservative um, in terms of the government's overall fiscal position over three years um, of the impact of these proposals. Um, I'm happy to go through, and maybe if people want to ask questions about the detail, um, but it's in the, I think it's on page 19 of the book, um, the detail of, the, of where those costings have come from. Yeah, page 19. Um, but it, it does create a relatively conservative fiscal position. Now, obviously, in any post-election negotiation, um, it's not just about our priorities, and there'll be other issues on the table. There's inflation adjustments in health and education as a bare minimum, for example. Um, so there are other cost pressures on the government, but this is costing these priorities that we've been putting forward. <coughs> So finally, just to go back to the beginning, um, this is about opportunities. Um, this is about New Zealand embracing the global green economic opportunities. This is about us transitioning our economy to a much more sustainable footing. Um, and of course, behind that, um, the values that sit behind it, it's about making sure that we have a decent society and where people get looked after and we don't have masses of poverty. It's also about looking after our natural environment and it's also about making sure that we don't destroy the climate system on which we all depend for our very lives. And so going into, um, going into this election, our priorities are going to be around uh, we want to clean up rivers, uh, we want to get kids out of poverty and we want to create green jobs. And we think um, kids' rivers jobs, um, that's a pretty... It's a pretty, uh, I think, a great, um, it's a pretty great prospect for a richer New Zealand, uh, and that's what we'll be going into this election as our priorities. So I'll, um, I'll leave it there and open it up for questions and uh, questions from the audience. What's the total cost of the jobs package? The total, total cost of the jobs package um, is around... Uh, let me just go back. <coughs> So the total cost of the jobs package um, is around two and a half billion, roughly speaking. And, then, and that's for the 100,000 jobs over three years? Um, yeah, the 100,000 jobs over three years. There's the, <coughs> the, the job stuff, is, if you look at the details of the job stuff, a big chunk of it is about the renewable energy um, sector. Um, and so whether that would happen over three years or, or a number of more years, we're not quite sure. Um, because it is necessarily an inexact science when it comes to predicting jobs in the private sector. So, so 100,000 jobs by, by when? Um, so it would be the target is to do 100,000 jobs over three years, um, but we're also, you know, you've got to be realistic about it. Um, so looking at, so the renewable energy sector offers real opportunity for lots of jobs. You could also talk about, you know, data hosting and cloud computing. New Zealand has great opportunities in that um, because we've got renewable energy. Um, hopefully once the second fibre optic cable comes across, we'll be in a nice position around that. There's obviously issues, uh, there's opportunities around liquid fuels um, that Nick was talking about earlier. Um, but we've just focused on the renewable energy sector in terms of trying to quantify it. And that would be 100,000 jobs un under a Labor government because if you, um, if you take out the, the sale of state-owned assets, which National would do, you come down to about 35 to 53, is that correct? If you look at, um, in terms of what would be the impact if uh, National proceeded with the um, partial privatisation of state-owned state -owned enterprises, um, clearly um, the partial privatisation doesn't mean they have no opportunities to engage in this global market. We just think that actually they'll be in a better position to do it um, if they're kept in public ownership and they partner with private. So obviously our, we think it would work better if they were kept in public ownership, but that doesn't mean that they can't have an orientation towards exports just because they're partially privatised. So you can you explain expense? exactly where these jobs are going to be in renewables? You're talking 47 to, 60, 47 to 65,000. That's a lot of people doing a lot of work. Exactly what work will they be doing? Um, so New Zealand has particular advantages in geothermal. Um, I mean, that's kind of our, our, probably our strongest area. Remember, we started the, the second major geothermal plant in the world was built in New Zealand. Um, and so those jobs are around manufacturing is a, is a key part of it. Um, those jobs are around the provision of expertise and services overseas and the provision of technology overseas. We've already started building um, the Heavy Engineering Research Association did an interesting report looking specifically at geothermal. Um, and, and what surprised me was the large number of companies, engineering companies, already deeply engaged in this space um, and the fact that they're already exporting this technology overseas. Uh, so that's where I think the opportunity lies. But we've you, used multipliers, in, uh, so the, we've used multipliers in there around the, in, the impact of, of manufacturing in particular. But if you export the technology and the ideas going overseas, people pick up the ideas and use it to develop their own economies, and 
you by negate what you're trying to do back here? Uh, no. I mean, if you, if you think about it, the, the opportunities are around whether you're manufacturing the components here and whether you're providing the services and the expertise over there. If you look at the, say, to look at it in reverse, the New Zealand economy has some large overseas-owned corporations that are involved in, say, contact energy or whatever. Um, and so uh, a, lot of the w a lot of the work that gets done in New Zealand by overseas multinationals um, has a big impact on those multinationals' job provision overseas, um, as well as in New Zealand. List um, for someone sitting at home tonight, watch, you know, watching this. Can you list some of the occupations or jobs that you that you that you're talking about here? Sure. Um, so in terms of, um, if you're talking about riparian fencing and planting um, around direct government investment, so that's, um, if you like, jobs that are targeted towards the rural sector um, and relative at the relatively low skilled end. Um, so they're you know, level entry jobs, if you like, um, so that we deal with some of the unemployment issues we have in the rural sector. And the same applies to a little bit more, uh, probably some more skilled jobs around pest control. Um, if you look at the housing sector, there's a bunch of jobs in terms of the housing sector and the building industry. And if you look at forestry, there's a whole bunch of jobs involved in forestry planting. Um, and then if you move to the kind of energy sector, um, you're talking about manufacturing jobs, you're talking about uh, managing, the, the, if you like, the technology and the services that go with um, electricity generation and management. We have a lot of skills around grid management in New Zealand as well. Did you have a plan for education in that respect? If these jobs are coming on in three years, people will probably need to change skills. Do you have a, do you have a, a, you know, a tertiary plan or something like that? Um, there will be some. Um, I, I think that, you know, and we've included a segment in there about training, a small segment about vocational training. Um, to some degree, it, it's going to be a bit responsive to what particular uh, markets or skills get to when we need. I mean, the thing about having a private, you know, if you argue that it's a private sector that's generating a lot of the jobs, is you, you can't necessarily write down now exactly what jobs you're going to need, but you can say they're going to be in this area. If there's as much potential in renewables as, as you seem to think there is, why aren't the SOEs in doing it already? If, it, if it's potentially so lucrative, one would assume that they'd already be doing it. To some degree they have. Um, so if you look at Meridian, which has probably pioneered the partnership model, um, whether it's WhisperTech or whether it's others, they've had a, a series of partnership models with other um, private sector, some of them uh, to some degree more than others. Um, and so, but I think largely it's because their focus has been relatively internal. Um, and we haven't kind of looked at the SOEs as big exporters. Um, and I think that needs to be the focus on those energy companies. I don't know if Nick might want to add something you probably know. Yeah, I just think there's been confusion. They've been very constrained, actually. It was only, I think, until about three or four years ago that they were able, and, and able to actually look outside what was defined as core business. And, you know, um, I know of instances where some of the energy SOEs have actually invented and, uh, invested in uh, Silicon Valley venture funds to try and access clean technology when, from our perspective, it seemed rather disjunctive that they weren't actually deploying their capital into the New Zealand venture market. So I think, really, it's sort of a bit of a case that no one really was fully aware of the ramifications and the opportunities here. So realistically, you got, I mean, you're saying up to 65,000 jobs in renewable energy with some of these kinds of partnerships, but, I mean, you've got to get, A, you've got to get something that's viable and is going to work, and you've got to get these companies together with the entrepreneurs. I mean, th three years doesn't seem like a very realistic time frame. Um, I agree with you. It's ambitious. Um, that's true. Uh, but if you look at the, the expansion that's happening in the renewable energy sector, it's quite rapid. Um, so the projections are, you know, 400 billion this year, 800 billion in 2015, the global renewable energy sector. Um, if we were able to get 1%, that's all we're talking about. It's a very small fraction of the global market. Then actually it does generate a lot of jobs in New Zealand. Um, we need to act quickly. This thing isn't staying still. Um, so it's like, you know, it's not like the world is kind of moving slowly on this. This is a rapidly expanding area. Um, China is throwing the kitchen sink at renewable energy. Um, if we want to be a, want to get a cut of that, we need to be ambitious. Uh, the, 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 if you like, the upside of being a small country in a large economy is that if you get a tiny part of a global market, it has a huge impact in New Zealand. Um, so that's kind of why it seems like such a big deal in New Zealand, because the global market's so large. I mean, you could argue Finland had a similar experience with, uh, obviously, with Nokia and, and telecommunications. Um, they got a, a significant market share of a very large market, which then became a huge industry in Finland um, with mobile phone technology. What you're talking about with the energy SOEs sounds very hands-on. Uh, are you actually, do you envisage them actually staying as SOEs? Because they are, it sounds linked at the moment, isn't it, the legislation? 
change the legislation around that? Or? Um, the, you wouldn't need to change the legislation. There's plenty of um, uh, levers within the legislation as it stands um, in terms of the relationship between the government and the SOEs. Um, actually, there's plenty of people in the SOEs who actually want to do this. Um, it's not like... Um, I, I'm sure some of the SOEs are a bit, you know, slow off the, a bit slow to move. But actually, there's heaps of people inside the SOEs who also see these opportunities. I mean, if you think about Mighty River Power, was it five years ago they were trying to build another coal-fired power station up at Marsden B, up near Whangarei, and that got blocked by essentially the environment movement. And since then, they've made a huge turn into geothermal, and they've been building geothermal like it's going out of fashion. Um, so there's a real appetite within the SOEs to actually um, engage in the renewable sector. And we've already started exporting uh, renewable energy stuff across the Pacific, North America, Southeast Asia. What's the difference between your policy of encouraging the SOEs to partner with the private sector in this regard, and what Labor has been talking about for quite some time? Um, to some degree, there, there's real commonality. Uh, there is commonality between it. Um, but for us, it's about the opportunities provided by the global green economy. Um, and actually really embracing that opportunity. Uh, so Labor did, um, I mean, uh, as Nick was referring to earlier, change the rules um, uh, went towards the end of their government um, around what SOEs could do. Um, but I actually think that we need to see this as one of the key drivers of our economy, so we need to be a bit more ambitious about it than that. And the, the renewable energy sector is just expanding rapidly. Um, we need to get a bit of it. Conservation Corps, putting a team of 3,000 paid conservation corps to work planting, um, doing some of the things you talked about, like possum control. Do you think that um, 396 million over three years is good value for money for 3,000 jobs? It's also about in terms, so we get the, the benefits there are in terms of jobs, but they're also in terms of carbon sequestration. Um, so there's real um, benefits for New Zealand in terms of balancing our Kyoto books. Because while the government talks about um, the advantages in, at the end of 2012, you know, that we, our, Kyoto, our Kyoto account's going to be even. Like I was saying before, we have got an ongoing problem, um, which is that that forest is due to come down in the 2020s. Um, so by actually um, doing some of this conservation work deals with some of the carbon issues. Obviously, forestry is a key part of it as well, um, but that's part of it. I, I'd also argue there's further spin-off in terms of brand protection. Um, if we don't do the kind of brand protection that I think you know, is envisaged in this package and which creates jobs, uh, then we have a real risk of, of losing clean, green and safe, uh, which is fundamental to our, our exports. But it is an expensive measure, isn't it? Uh, there are a number of it. it, it the things are expensive, there's no question. Um, we've tried to keep the expensive measures as limited as we could, and we've tried to cost all the measures so that people can see how much it will cost and how much um, increased revenue we will take in. Um, because I think, you, you know, these are straightened times. Um, and so we've tried to be quite conservative about how much, where we're spending money. But it's also true that we need to take advantage of the opportunities. And where is the money coming from? Will there be new money? Will it be reprioritised in terms of the two and a half billion or the, that we talked about before? Um, so if you look at the package as a whole, um, it, there are clearly uh, revenue streams within it. Um, and I'm happy to talk through those. But there is considerably more revenue streams than there is extra spending. Is, will there be spending up front, though? Um, there will be some spending up front, yeah, but there's also some revenue streams up front, um, quite a lot of revenue streams up front. But a lot of those revenue streams, are, if not all of them, apart from maybe the capital gains of labour, are entirely unrealistic. I mean, National has made it abundantly clear that they don't see, they're, not, they're not a government that will introduce more tax. So that rather, you know, in that context, it's not such a modest spend, $4 billion, is it? I mean, it, and are you willing to kind of break the package down into much smaller pieces um, when you're sitting around the table negotiating a deal? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, obviously in any post-election negotiation, uh, we'll be putting our priorities on the table, um, and <clears throat> but you don't always get everything you want. Um, and so we'll be looking at what's possible. Now, clearly, for example, the home insulation scheme, um, I, would, I would expect that that would be something that National would be looking at extending. Um, uh, we haven't we haven't made an agreement about that, but I would expect so. It's been a, you know it's been a very successful scheme. Uh, so there'll be things like that where you can say, yeah, that scheme's work. We'll extend it. Um, there'll be other areas where they won't agree with us, but you know that's the nature of post-election negotiation. What would be the highest priorities? Uh, well, I mean, in terms of uh, what we've done is give these three priorities: kids, rivers, jobs. Um, and uh, so we would be putting all of those on the table um, because we think getting kids out of poverty 
It's, it's the right thing to do and it has enormous economic benefits because of the cost of inequality. Um, and cleaning up our rivers is you know, the right thing to do in terms of our environment, also has fantastic economic benefits, um, particularly in terms of brand protection. And these green jobs packages, um, I think there's some very practical ideas in here. Um, and you know, putting those on the table I think is, you know, is part of the post-election process as well. In terms of the jobs, uh, though, leaving aside the hunt installation, what are the priorities after that? Uh, well, I mean, in terms of, uh, uh, well, I mean, if you look at the, the, the kind of the government spending side of it, um, which is, you know, where the government has some, you know, direct say over things, um, you know, we've put together a number of those and we've put them all on the table, I think. If you're talking about just the government spending side of it, I mean, <clears throat> ha having an increase in investment in research and development I think is really critical to New Zealand. If we don't move from 1.3%, um, I think we'll continue to go backwards. I mean, it's hard for me to answer your question directly because, in a sense, we want, we're putting a package on the table and you're asking me to break it down and kind of rank it. Um, uh, and I understand why you, why you asked that, but I'm, uh, what I'm saying is that we would be putting the package on the table. But, you know, the, the R&D spend really is, a, is an investment in our future. And the, the tree planter thing, is you talking about government directly paying people to plant trees or $36 million being the cost of changing what the ETS to provide an incentive for that tree planting? <coughs> that, that, that part of the package is about providing a floor in the carbon price for the forestry sector. Um, so a $25 a tonne floor for the carbon price in the, uh, for, for the forestry sector. It has certain risks um, because if the long run, if the price were to fall under that and then the government's guaranteed a floor price, um, we expect the price of carbon to increase over time. Um, by providing a floor, you provide cer certainty to the forestry sector. And that's why you get such um, a big, uh, a big bang for your buck, if you like, um, is because it's a relatively low investment, but you get a big return in terms of jobs. This is most of it. There's a few. Um, we've got a set of priorities, but these are the top three, if you like. Um, we'll be announcing uh, kind of uh, within the, the fiscal position that we've got here, there's a few um, kind of uh, things that are, will be announced within that um, uh, around a few other areas. Uh, but these are the top three. <laughs> Sorry. What I, as, what I mean to say was, so these are the top three. Kids Rivers Jobs, right? That's our top three priorities. Um, we have a number of other priorities. Um, which actually the fiscal spend is contained within the budget we've presented. Um, so we have some other priorities we'll be announcing around conservation, around transport and so forth. But we've tried to um, incorporate those within the overall fiscal position um, because we don't expect that we're going to be announcing lots of new spending. Just on the uh, total number of jobs you're talking about, do you see many of them coming out of like the, the non-green economy in terms of jobs that aren't there? Yeah, I mean, w one of the... One of the realities of a modern market economy is there's constant churn, um, and so uh, you know even if you do even if you do nothing, there's going to be the destruction of jobs and the creation of jobs, um, and so it necessarily in the transition, um, what we're trying to do is create green jobs. Um, there'll be other jobs, you know, as automatically happens in a market economy that will become the, you know that will end, um, and so it's a matter of creating, making sure we've got those green jobs. Obviously, in the long run, um, you know, the, the coal mining industry um, is going to be a, an industry that, uh, <clears throat> if we're going to live within the climate constraints, that there can't be a huge future for the coal industry internationally. Um, it's going to have a part. We're not suggesting close down existing mines, but we're not suggesting open new ones. If um, these um, 47 to 65,000 um, jobs in the um, renewables under, if, if we can hang on to state assets. If we don't, if we partially privatise them, have you done any numbers on, on, on what that number might come down to? Um, no, we haven't. Um, the, the, the risk of partial privatisation is, uh, I would argue, is um, that aside from everything else is that you could lose control because partial privatisation can become a slippery slope, right? Um, and so you lose control and once you lose control you don't necessarily have them headquartered or have the research and development in New Zealand and you don't necessarily get viewed as a centre for exporting from but rather as a profit centre. 
Um, so, in, you know, a large international corporation will look at the, if it owns the New Zealand energy companies, will see that as a place to make money. It won't necessarily see it as a place to export renewable energy technology from. It might, but there's no guarantees if you don't own it. Um, so that's the advantage of keeping it in public ownership. You've acknowledged that the sort of jobs uh, target in terms of the renewables that it might not be achievable or it's ambitious at the target for three years. Does that mean that the revenue stream over three years is a pretty hefty amount of money? Is that so rather ambitious too? Um, well, I mean, if you look at uh, the breakdown of that revenue stream, um, the, there's, uh, so you've got the increased tax revenues from raising the minimum wage. Uh, you know, that, that's pretty straightforward. You've got the levy on irrigation use. That's pretty straightforward. Uh, you've got co capital gains tax. Um, so we've suggested one, one billion over three years. Um, so depending on how you want to, you know, the tax working group talked about four and a half billion when it was fully implemented per year. Um, we've suggested one billion over three years because it takes time for a capital gains tax to come into play um, and it depends what's going on in the economy. So we've taken a bit of a punt there. The temporary levy on earthquake levy is pretty straightforward. Uh, the, the earthquake levy is reasonably straightforward. Um, <clears throat> and then we've re reprioritised some government spending on new motorways. So, you know, the government has this very large spending program um, we're reprioritising some money away from new motorways. The phasing out on subsidies and ETS, additional mining royalties. I think they're all, um, yeah, I, th I think that's pretty, pretty well quantified, actually. I, I, I think when you look at the revenue side of it, it's pretty straightforward. I mean, I'm happy to, to have a debate about any of those figures, but I think when you look at each of those figures, um, they're pretty sound. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much.